Hi folks, welcome to this video on motor units and muscular contractions. This is quite a bit of uh, intense biology. What you've got to remember is, on this kind of topic, is a case of remembering these things. In terms of questions on these topics, they're not really going to ask you very much apart from what is it, how does it work. So even though there are quite a few new terms here that you probably haven't heard of before, just stay calm, watch the video, rewind as much as you need to, pause on bits that you need to, we'll get you through it. Right, let's start by saying that your skeletal muscles, the muscles that attach to your skeleton that you control, that um, you know your biceps, your quadriceps, your hamstrings, glutes, all these kind of muscles, they are made up of thousands of muscle fibers. All right. Now, um, each one of those muscle fibers is made of a myofibril. That's not overly important right now, but you know what we're saying is here is a bundle of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven muscle fibers. Each one of these cylindrical things is a muscle fiber. So when we want to produce a contraction, these individual muscle fibers will contract. All, you know, sorry, all, uh, the, th the thousands of muscle fibers that make up the muscles will contract and we will have a contraction, the entire muscle will contract. That's how we sometimes think of it. However, it is a little bit more complicated than that because if you think you've got to contract your quads, your hammies, your triceps, your deltoids, but you've got to contract them and pick up really heavy objects, and then you've got to contract them and pick up very light objects, you know. So we've got to be able to control the strength of our contractions and therefore control the number of muscle fibres that are contracting. It's very rare that we want all of the muscle fibres all at the same time to contract. They're for all out massive, big, powerful contractions. We don't do them very often during the day. So a lot of the time our day is spent just recruiting the right number of muscle fibres. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Now, there's a special part of the brain that controls all of our muscular contractions, right? And that is called the cerebellum. So in my awful handwriting, I'm going to write that there. The cerebellum is in the brain, and I know I'm going to spell Brian now, make sure I spell brain, is in the brain, and that's the part of the brain that controls uh, our muscular movements, our muscular contractions. Now, what is this diagram showing? It says this dendrite. Basically, this is a cell. This is representing a cell inside your cerebellum. There are millions, probably billions of cells inside, inside your cerebellum that control movements. But this is one cell in the cerebellum that is controlling the movement. Now, what we've got here, look at all these weird and wonderful terms. Let's get it down to what we need to know. It says here an axon and things like that. We're going to know that as a neuron. Now, I've put neuron slash nerve. I'm from Hull, so I say nerve. You might say nerve. Okay, whatever you prefer. So this is... I want you to ignore the word ax axon. Let's keep it simple. This is a neuron or a nerve, right? So what happens is, when you, if I want to contract these muscle fibres, the cell in my cerebellum inside the brain that controls movement will generate an impulse. That impulse will pass, like it says here, passes signals that will pass the impulse down the neuron, down the nerve, into the muscle fibres, and the muscle fibres will contract. Now this entire thing, this entire structure, is called a motor unit. So let's quickly get that down now. So to recap then, and there's a term here that you might be thinking, motor inputs, you haven't mentioned them yet, don't worry, I'm going to. So a motor unit is a cell in your cerebellum, and if this is an individual motor unit, cell in your cerebellum, it generates the impulse. The impulse travels down the neuron or the nerve, there's number two. Now these tiny little blue splodges where the nerve meets the muscle fibres, they're called motor end plates. Okay, and then finally the muscle fibres themselves. Those four things make up a motor unit. So if you want the muscle fibres to contract, the cell body produces an impulse, it passes down the neuron or the nerve to the motor end plates, into the muscle fibres, and those muscle fibres will then contract. Now we're going to deal with this over the next couple of minutes, and then we're done, so just stay with it. The hardest thing to get your head around, and it was the same for me when I was at college, I always presumed that if this was my bicep muscle group, there was just one neuron, one nerve, connecting my cerebellum my brain to my bicep but that's not the case and think about that it wouldn't make sense if there was just one neuron one nerve 
connected to all the muscle fibres in your bicep, your bicep could only do one of two things. It could either fully contract or just fully relax. Because if I send an impulse down there, the muscle fibres are going to contract. So what I must have is, I must have lots of, probably thousands of motor units in every single one of my muscle groups, particularly the large, big muscle groups like your quadriceps, like your hamstrings, like your gastronemia, your pectoralis major, things like that. So what we're saying is there could be 100,000 muscle fibres in a muscle, let's say. So there's 100,000. We can only see, what do we say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can only see seven here, but there could be 100,000 muscle fibres in an individual muscle. Although we could only see seven muscle fibres attached here, there could be a neuron, let's say, with a thousand muscle fibres attached to the end of it. Okay? So in other words, this muscle that we're talking about that has 100,000 muscle fibres will be made up of 100 motor units. So there'll be 100 cells in the cerebellum of the brain, each with its own neuron coming from it, and each with its own 1,000 muscle fibres attached and that would make 100 motor units. Now that could be the biceps, the triceps, the quadriceps, the hamstrings, things like that. So what we're saying is each of your, particularly your big muscle groups, your large gross muscle groups, um, or muscles, sorry, they are made up of lots of different motor units, lots of different neurons, lots of cells in the cerebellum that are controlling that individual muscle group, but lots of different muscle fibers within that. It will make sense, trust me, stick with it. Now what we've got here, is a little bit more detail and a blown up picture. So this is the neuron, that we've the cell body somewhere up here. The neuron's coming down here. Here is the neuron. These little finger-like alien creature looking hands, they're the motor end plates. And this big circular thing is the muscle fiber. As we've said, muscle fibers are made up of smaller little units called myofibrils. Don't worry about that. This big cylindrical thing is a muscle fiber. There's the neuron. These are the motor end plates. So if this muscle fiber is going to contract, the impulse is going to come from the cell body, down the neuron, into the motor end plates, and that's going to stimulate the muscle fiber to contract. But we need to know a few key terms about how that happens. So I'm just going to move this. Oops. I'm just going to move this over here so we can get it down in a way that's too easy to understand. So, as you can see, this is creating a contraction. How does it begin? We've got to generate an impulse, or the cerebellum, or the cell body in the cerebellum has got to create an impulse. That's the first thing that's got to happen. Now, here's another term, action potential. Where are we suddenly throwing these terms from? I'm just telling you one because they might word it like this in the exam, so you need to be aware of it. An action potential is another name for an impulse that is big enough to create a contraction. So think of it this way, it's the potential for the muscle to contract, hence why it's called an action potential. The potential for the muscle, muscle to act and contract, hence why it's called action potential. So that impulse is sent by the cerebellum or the cell body, and that impulse or action potential is sent down the neuron to the motor end plates, these hand-like structures that attach the neuron onto the muscle fibre. Oh God, here's another couple of weird words. What are these now? Neurotransmitter and acetal, acetylcholine, acetylcholine, however you want to pronounce it. Right, what this is, before you start panicking, take one of these little finger-like structures there, that's it there, blown up and magnified, right? So the impulse has travelled down, the action potential has travelled down to the motor end plate. Here it is. Now, as you can see, there's a gap here. The mo yeah, I said the motor end plate attaches to the muscle fiber. I was wrong. It attaches into a little space, a little groove on the uh, muscle fiber. But there is a gap between the end of the motor end plate there and this wavy edge is the edge of the muscle fiber. And that gap there in between the two is called the synaptic cleft. Okay, that gap there, the synaptic cleft. So we'll do... A little arrow there, right? If the impulse or the action potential travels down there, in order for it to pass that gap into the muscle fibre, we've got to release a neurotransmitter, a chemical that will allow 
the impulse or the action potential to move from the motor end plate into the muscle fibre. And we call that neurotransmitter acetylcholine or acetylcholine, however you want to pronounce it. Okay? So, yeah, it's a bit, I mean, at the end of the day, this is tough, it's difficult terminology, but like I said, the questions that are going to be on this are describe how you create a contraction. You're not going to have to analyse it or assess it or discuss it, describe how it takes place. So, you just need to know these terms and you need to know the process. And finally, then, and relatively straightforward, if that impulse that was sent at the start, the action potential, is big enough, if it's powerful enough, it will, along with the help of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, get across the synaptic cleft into the muscle fibre and the muscle fibre will contract, right? So what we're saying is, if a muscle fibre is going to contract, that's got to take place, but in essence, for a contraction to take place, two things must occur. Number one, we have got to create a big enough uh, impulse action potential from the cerebellum. Your brain has got to produce the impulse that is powerful enough to get down the neuron into the motor end plates. And two, when it's there, we must have released enough acetylcholine, enough neurotransmitter for that impulse to then jump or get across the synaptic cleft into the muscle fiber. If one or both of those things don't occur, you will not contract your muscles. They will not contract and you will not move yourself or move your object or move your opponent, whatever it is you happen to be doing at that time. And finally then, right, I mentioned it right at the start. How can we vary the strength of a contraction? How can I contract my biceps to pick up a pen or pick up a cup of tea very carefully without spilling any, but then also contract my biceps to pick up a dumbbell, which is a lot heavier? If it's the same muscle contracting, what we've got is we've got something called the all or non law, also known as the all or non principle, uh, depending which books, which resources, which website you're looking on. But it's the same thing. As we said right at the start, in your let's stick with the biceps. In your bicep muscle groups, you might have a hundred thousand muscle fibers, and a thousand of those, every one thousand of those fibers is attached to one neuron. So you've got 100 motor units, 100 cells in your cerebellum, each with its own neuron coming down, each with its own 1,000 muscle fibres connected to it. And those 100 motor units make up your bicep muscle group or your bicep muscle, right? So what we've got here is a shortened down version of that. What we've got here is there is the bicep look. And what you can see is... We've put the spinal cord here. Remember, the spinal cord connects up to the brain. So you've got the cerebellum that's going to generate the impulse. The impulse is going to pass down the neuron in the spinal cord, come out with the right level, right? And as you can see, all the red muscle fibres make up motor unit one. All the blue muscle fibres make up motor unit two. And all the purple motor fibre, uh, muscle fibres make up motor unit three. So there's an example of three motor units that are in your bicep. So like we said, you've probably got 100 motor units that make up your bicep. Now, the all or non law states that if you send a big enough impulse down motor unit one, down the red neuron, and you release enough neurotransmitter acetylcholine, every single one of those red muscle fibers will contract. All of them will contract. Not half, if an input or 10% or whatever, if one impulse is big enough and it goes down that red neuron to the red muscle fibres and there's enough neurotransmitter, all of those red muscle fibres will contract. If no impulse is sent down or the impulse is too weak or there isn't enough neurotransmitter, there isn't enough acetylcholine, none of the red muscle fibres will contract. Hence why it's called the all or none law. If I send a big enough impulse down that neuron, all of the muscle fibres attached to the end of that neuron will contract. If the impulse is not big enough, or no impulse is sent, or the neurotransmitter is not uh, released, none of those red muscle fibres will contract. The same is true for motor unit 2 and motor unit 3. Hence why we have an all or none law. So what we're saying here is... If I want to produce a strong contraction, if I want to lift a heavy weight with my bicep, I'm going to send impulses in this diagram down all three 
of those motor nerves, those motor neurons, so that and those and those impulses have got to be big enough, and therefore all the muscle fibres connected to all three of those motor units will contract. I will produce a big, strong, powerful contraction. And therefore, if I want a weak or weak air contraction, I will send impulses down fewer of these motor units, maybe only one or two. Remember, if I send an impulse down motor unit one, the red one, all of those red muscle fibers will contract, not 10% of them, not half of them. So I can vary the strength of a contraction by just switching on certain numbers of muscle fibers within an individual motor unit. They are all contracting in that motor unit or none of them are contracting in that motor unit. So what I've got to do is for a weak contraction, I'm going to maybe only going to send an impulse down motor unit one or motor unit two or motor unit three. Therefore, I will only switch on a third of the muscles within that muscle group, a muscle fiber, sorry, within that muscle group. So that's the key way of varying the strength of a contraction. And it explains why, even as experienced performers, we sometimes still underhit things, overhit things. We've got to learn to switch on and recruit the right number of motor units so that we switch on and recruit the right number of motor, uh, muscle fibres. We've all grown up, we've all been babies where we drop things and bang things and we had to learn through practice and repetition how much force to generate. That was what we were doing. Training the cerebellum, to send the right number of impulses and the right impulses down the right number of motor units. And that's what the all or non law is based on. So there is one other thing to finish up on just really, really quickly, just to make sure we're happy with it. And just a quick thing to add as well. We've got two key things we can do here. In order to vary the strength of a contraction, uh, you know, make a strong contraction or a weak one. Number one, recruit the correct number of motor units comes back to what we've got up here if i want a strong contraction send impulses and recruit lots of motor units all three in this case if i want a weak contraction send impulses down fewer one or two in order to recruit fewer muscle fibers but finally also we can recruit the correct size of motor units what do i mean by that think of the example that we've been working on so far with this biceps we've said for example one motor unit and i'll just write this down a motor unit might have a thousand muscle fibers okay attached to it in this diagram you know just because diagrams have got to be small we've only got three four five but you know some motor units have a thousand muscle fibers attached to them however oops just dropped my pen however some motor units definitely do only have 10 to 100 muscle fibers just depends on the size of the muscle the location of it so again if i want a strong contraction i will recruit the larger motor units those with lots of hundreds thousands of muscle fibers attached to them because remember if the impulse goes down they're all going to contract whereas if i want a weak contraction i will send impulses down the motor units where there are fewer or smaller uh Muscles, smaller numbers of muscle fibers, sorry. So we can have there in brackets, this is an example of a large motor unit, whereas this is an example of a small motor unit because it's got fewer muscle fibers. So they're the things, they're the things that you need to know about how a muscle contracts and how we can vary the strength of a contraction. A lot of new terms, take your time with it, make sure you watch this video as many times as you need and have a look at some typical questions in the textbooks and in the resources that your teachers give you. Good luck with it, folks.